Okay, so today we are going to talk about differentiation, which is a continuation of the prerequisites for this particular class. Uh, but you know, probably you have uh, learned about differentiation of functions of one variable, right? And if you recall the definition, so f is a function from r to r. So you define the differentiation of x at a point, let's say y, as f of y plus h minus f of y over h, and then you take limit h goes to 0. Okay, and that's defined as a uh, derivative, the first derivative of uh, the function. And if the limit exists at all points y in R, then you say that the function is differentiable. And then you can repeat this process. You can find the second derivative, third derivative, and so on. Uh, okay. So now the question is, how do we extend this definition to functions of multiple variables? So now I have a function f from r into r. And I want to differentiate this function. Right. So one way to do that is to consider a point y, consider in rn, consider a direction d also in rn. So you are at a point y, this is your rn, and you are looking at a direction d uh, at the point y. And then you can define the directional derivative uh, del h. Uh, I, I forgot what the, what the notation for directional derivative is, but it is something to do with you define the point y and then you define the direction d and that is limit h goes to 0 f of y plus h multiplied by d and h is a scalar here minus f of y over h okay so this is known as the directional derivative It may have some other notation in the book. I just forgot the notation for directional derivative. Okay, so let's pick the directions d to be unit vectors along all n dimensions. So let's pick d equals to ei, where ei is 0, 0, 0, and then 1, and then 0, 0, 0. And this is the ith position. Okay, and then I can find the directional derivative along the ith direction, and that is given by del f over del xi at a point y, which is limit h goes to 0, f of y plus h ei minus f of y over h. Okay, and I'm going to create a vector gradient of f at y, which is del f over del x1, del f over del x2, del f over del xn. And this is the first derivative uh, 
of f at y Okay, so by picking specific directions along the coordinate axis, we now define a derivative of the function. But what you see is that the derivative actually lies in Rn. And you see the original space was also, the function was defined over Rn. So there is a relationship uh, there's a relationship between the domain of the function f and the derivative, uh, the, the size of the derivative, or not the size, but the dimension of the derivative of the function f. Okay, so they have to be in the same dimensional space. Yes? This might be a silly question, but uh, is this at all related to that maybe naive practice that we all learned in Calc 3? So if you have a multivariate function and you want to take the partial derivative, right, you're taking the derivative with respect to one of the variables and keeping the rest as constants? Yes. This is the same process? Yes. So you're keeping the rest as constant. Okay. Right? You're only moving along one direction. It's the same thing. It's not a naive question. You, you see, the thing is, when they are teaching you Calc 3, they can't really reveal all the information. So they have to reveal some of it and hope that in the future you will fill in the blanks. Um, if you take even higher level math courses, you will realize that the derivative actually lies in what is known as dual space of the original space. But in Euclidean space, the dual space is the space itself. So, so that's why I say Rn there and Rn here. But that's, uh, yeah, that's hiding a little bit of more structure that's there in the derivative, the definition of derivative. Anyway, that's not important here, okay? So the domain is Rn, or a subset of Rn, and the gra gradient of f will also be uh, taking values in Rn. Any questions so far? Okay, now the directional derivative that I define here actually is gradient of Fy transpose D. So this is the limit h goes to 0, f of y plus hd minus f of y over h. So it turns out that these two limits are actually equal. So this, I, I should write it as fact. Uh, one can prove it more rigorously, but uh, this is the relationship that holds. So once you define the derivative in this manner, you just have to take the inner product with D, and what you get is the directional derivative of the function f. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's do an example. I have f as a function of x1 and x2. Uh, give me a function, a simple function. x1 plus 2x3. Oh, that's too simple. Uh, let me make it x1 sine of x2. Okay, a uh, little bit more complicated. So how do I find the derivative gradient of f at y? Uh, I have to differentiate this with respect to x1, keeping x2 as constant, so I get sine of x2. This has to be evaluated at y, and then I have to keep x2 constant, and I have to, sorry, I have to take, keep x1 constant and uh, take the derivative with respect to x2, so I have x1 cos of x2, and this also has to be evaluated at y. And so what I have is sine y2 and x1 cos of y2. 
Okay, and this idea can be generalized to any dimensional function. Okay, those of you who might be interested in neural networks or deep neural networks, uh, the dimension n is of the order of a million or more. Okay, but the idea, the simple idea works in any dimensional space. Yes? So in, in the, for the first element, we take um, x2 as constant yes. and derive respect to x1. Yes. So then why do you then evaluate x2 as if it was all like constant? And you do the same uh, in the second case. So your, your goal is free by yeah, should that first one be a y1, or should it be there because there's not many x1 there? So this is, is so. So this is constant, okay? So sine of x2 is a constant. Yeah. So you have a constant multiplied by x1, yeah. and then you take the derivative with respect to x1, then all is left is the constant. Right. So I have sine of x2, right? Exactly. But now x, x is a generic variable in the space. I'm evaluating this derivative at a specific point y in the space. So then I have to substitute x2 with the corresponding value of the vector y. So we go y, y1 then? Yeah, what, what would that be? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Good, everyone is not sleeping in the class. Okay, uh, so now we have defined the first derivative. Now we want to define the second derivative of this function. And now we have a problem because in this case, the first derivative, let me call this g, g of y, g is a function from r to r, and I can apply the same principle and find the second derivative of the function f. But in this case, gradient of f is a function from rn to rn. Okay? What I, what I did here was a function from Rn to R. So I know how to find the derivative of a function from Rn to R. Now I have a function that goes from Rn to Rn. So how do I find the derivative of this function? Any thoughts? Okay, okay, so let's try to reason how to find the derivative of this uh, function. So I'm going to erase this part. Well, let me erase this side. So let's say I have a function g which maps from Rn to R2. So g of x is g1 of x and g2 of x. Now that I have decomposed this function into two separate functions, right? So you can think of this as g of x. So this one is g1 of y and this is g2 of y. So each of these functions are so gi is a function from rn to r. So now I can differentiate it, right? I can differentiate gi by applying the same principle. So the entire, that will form a new set of functions, right? Right. And that just becomes the Yes. But then the question is, how do you arrange these vectors? So remember the gradient of g1 is a function from Rn to, again, Rn, right? So what would the gradient of G look like? So the convention is gradient of G is gradient of G1 of X, so that's the first column of this matrix, and gradient of G2 of X, that's the second column of the matrix, okay? So now that if you, now you have a function, well, going back here, you have a function from Rn to R2, then gradient of G is a function from Rn 
to R n cross 2. Okay, so it has a single, so it has uh, n rows and two columns. Okay, so we can now extend that idea here and I have the second derivative of f as derivative with respect to x of the derivative with respect to x1 of f and then derivative with respect to x of derivative with respect to x2 of f and so on. Okay, and this will be a value in R n cross n. Okay. So this derivative with respect to x1 of f is the same as this particular function. And this is derivative with respect to x2 of f, that's this function and so on. Okay, so now I have a matrix. So I started with a function of multiple variables, I differentiated it, I got a vector, I differentiated it again, I got a matrix. What happens if I differentiate it again? Sorry? A higher order structure. What's that structure called? Tensor. Has, has anyone heard of tensors? Okay, so that higher order structure is called tensor. Right? So a vector or a matrix, they are also tensors. So tensors are essentially generalization of vectors and matrices to higher order. Term. So in that case, the third derivative of f will be, will sit in the space R n cross n cross n. Okay, it will be a three dimensional matrix. Okay, and three dimensional matrices are very useful in, uh, in cases where there is a two dimensional signal but there is a concept of time, so things like videos. Okay, so if you're doing video processing, you generally encounter three-dimensional matrices. Now, this is a very special class of three-dimensional matrix. Of course, video, the time axis is going to be much longer than the image part, but uh, I wanted to give you an idea about why tensors are important or why three-dimensional matrices are important. And it's quite a hot field at the moment to work on tensor decomposition. Okay, to do time series analysis. Okay, so that's it. We will never talk about the third derivative of the function in this class. Okay, we'll keep things simple. Now I want to identify some structure in this particular matrix. So let me find the second derivative of the function. Where do I write it? Okay, I'm going to write it here. So I have to take the derivative with respect to y1 here. So that's 0. And then cos of y2. I have to take the derivative with respect to y1. So that's cos of y2 and then derivative minus y sine of y2. Okay, so that's the second derivative of this function. What kind of structure do you see in this matrix? Sorry? Symmetric. symmetric, right? This is symmetric. So why is this symmetric? What's the magic? Any thoughts? 
Yes. I can't remember what the property is, but if, if the functions have some certain level of continuity, the yes. second and third derivatives, and the order of those does not matter. So yes. Dy dx is the same thing as dy. Yes. So that's right. Now you won't answer any other question in this class. You've already answered many. <laughs> you can ask questions, but not answer questions. OK, so let's write down the full-blown second derivative of the function. This is del 2f over del x1 square, and then del 2f over del x1 del x2. x1 del xn and then del 2f over del x2 del x1 okay so it looks something like this and what you will notice is that the difference the difference between this term and this term is just the order in which the differentiation was done. right? So here I differentiate with respect to x2 first, then I differentiate with respect to x1. In this case, I differentiate with respect to x1, and then I differentiate with respect to x2. Okay. Now, the fact is, if the function is twice differentiable, and the second derivative is continuous, which in this case it is, it is actually infinitely differentiable. So it is, it is continuous. So all derivatives are continuous. And in this, and th therefore, the order of differentiation does not matter. So del 2f over del x1, del, or del xi, del xj, continuous implies del xi del xj equals to del xj del xi. This is a fact. Now in this class, we will never consider a, con uh, a function whose derivatives are going to become discontinuous. So those are pathological cases. We are not going to study pathological cases in this class. So for all practical purposes, the second derivative of all functions that we consider in this class are going to be symmetric. Okay, so I want to write it here. So the upshot is symmetric. Now, I'm not saying it is positive definite or positive semi-definite or negative definite or whatever. All I'm saying is it's symmetric. It could have positive eigenvalues. It could have negative eigenvalues. It could have zero eigenvalues. We don't know. OK, it's symmetric. Any questions so far? OK, perfect. Now I'm going to uh, talk about chain rule. So how does chain rule work for functions of multiple variables? Uh, and I'm just going to write the expression, and you can probably verify it later. So I have h of x defined as g of f of x, then gradient of h of x is defined as gradient of f of x, gradient of g evaluated at f of x. Okay, these things work out dimensionally correct and uh, based on the 
based on the way we have defined the uh, uh, derivative of multiple variables, functions of multiple variables, uh, you can see whether you can check at home that this formula is indeed correct. So this is chain rule. Then I have mean value theorem, which says that x, y in R, well, okay. So in single dimension, if you have x and y in R, and f is a function from R to R, then the mean value theorem says fy minus fx, it should be differentiable. Gradient of f at c, y minus x, where c lies in x, y. Okay, this is the mean value theorem in one dimension. We can extend this to functions of multiple dimensions as follows. F from Rn to R, x comma d in Rn, then F of x plus t, Fx plus d transpose gradient of fx plus 1 over 2 d transpose this is a uh, alpha is in 0 comma 1 Then we have Taylor series. So everything that we did for functions of single variable, you know, you might have studied it somewhere in your calculus class. Um, everything you can do for single functions of single variable, you can also do for functions of multiple variable, as long as you define things appropriately. Yes. So see, C is between x and y, right? So you can write C as alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y, right? Because it's between, where alpha is between 0 and 1, right? So, so x and y are two points. I pick a point anywhere in the middle. I can write it as a convex combination of the two endpoints. Uh, and I'm doing the same thing here. So I have a point x. I have this uh, direction D, right? So this is my X plus D. And all I'm doing is viewing this function only along this direction, right? And then I'm applying the mean value theorem along this direction, okay? Then you can define the Taylor series as follows, f of x plus t transpose gradient of fx over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial fxd plus 1 over 3 factorial. And then you have a tensor, right? Three-dimensional, sorry, uh, the third derivative of the function multiplied by d comma d comma d and so on. Right? But since these terms are very hard to imagine, we will just use small o of norm of d square. Okay? So what is the small o notation? Small o notation means that limit of, so 
y is equal to small o of x, well, I am already using y and x. I need some other numbers. Uh, a and b. A and b. Have, have we used a and b somewhere? No, we have not. Okay. So a is small o of b if and only if limit b goes to 0, a over b is equal to 0. Okay, that's the small o notation. And that's the notation I'm using here. So that is the question to say that all of those terms are basically relative to or increasing more slowly than the norm yield to. Yes. Yes, but you know the thing that is hidden here, the constant that is hidden here are in some sense appropriate eigenvalues of the three-dimensional or four-dimensional or five-dimensional matrices. Now if your function is, uh, is such that, so a function like e raised to one over x square, right, it, it escapes to infinity very quickly, then some of these things cannot be defined unless you restrict yourself to a small subset. Right, where the function may be well defined, Lipschitz continuous, and so on. Right, so you have to be careful when you are defining terms like these. But as we, as I mentioned earlier, we are not going to look at pathological cases in this class. So everywhere this term is well bounded, and as d goes to zero, this term actually is negligibly small in comparison to the first three terms of the expansion. Okay. Okay, so this term is small, small, and these terms dominate. Okay, whenever the size of D is small. In most cases, we are going to look at only small perturbations around the point X. And so this assumption tends to hold true. OK. Any questions so far? Chain rule, mean value theorem, Taylor series. OK. All of us are familiar with this. Now I want to move on to a convex, convex analysis. So that's the last of all uh, material we need to understand the course. So convex analysis. Now if you go to the book, look, look at the appendices of the book, uh, there is a lot of discussion in there. You don't have to know everything in order to learn what's happening in this class. But if you want to come up with your own algorithms and if you want to prove that something converges, you should become familiar with what's there in the appendix. It won't be covered in the class. but uh, it's all easy, relatively easy to follow. And, and, and I think most of the students who are taking this class are undergraduate and master students, right? So you don't ever have to do the proof and you're not going to be designing algorithms except for maybe some of you. So you don't really have to go through the entire uh, mathematical mumbo jumbo that's required to understand optimization from adequate depth. Okay. So the first definition I want to cover is convex set. So C in Rn is convex if and only if xy belongs to C, alpha belongs to 0, 1, implies alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y belongs to C. Now what's the picture? The picture is I have a set that looks like this. 
I pick a point x1 and y1, I draw a line between these x1 and y1, and the entire line should actually lie within the set. Okay? And this should hold for all for all x, y. For every x, y in C and for every alpha in 0, 1. Okay? So now we, we picked a point x1, we picked a point y1, we drew a line and we saw that it's in the set. But we cannot immediately conclude that this is a convex set. Because this has to hold for every possible x and y within the set. So now we need to look for a pathological case. What are the two points in this set where if I draw the line between the two points, it wouldn't lie within the set? Okay, so let me pick a point here and a point there. And I draw a line. And oh, oh, this is not part of the set. So it's not a convex set. Too bad. So typical convex sets would be x in Rn, norm of x is less than or equal to R. So this is a solid sphere. And note that I say solid sphere and not a hollow sphere because just if you just have the surface of the sphere, it's not convex. Okay. And then C equals x in Rn, Ax less than or equal to B, that's convex. What are the other cases? C equals x in Rn, Ax equals to B. Okay, an empty set would be convex by definition because there is no point inside it, so you don't have to check anything. But, uh, but assuming that these are non-empty sets, they are easy. It's easy to show that they are convex sets. Another easy fact to prove is C1, C2 convex implies C1 intersection C2 is convex. Okay, so intersection of two convex sets is convex. But the union of two convex sets may not be convex. So here is my one convex set, here is my another convex set. It's not convex. I, if I take the union, it's not convex. If I take the intersection, it's null set. So by definition, it is convex. Yes. So what's the definition of A and B here? Is a matrix or Yeah, any matrix. And B is a scale. B is a no, B is also a matrix. So oh, I I I think I haven't introduced this notation. So when I say a vector is less than or equal to another vector, it means that element wise those vectors are small. So I say X is less than or equal to Y, this implies X one less than Y one, X two less than Y two xn less than yn. Okay, This is known as lexico lexicographic ordering. Um, and that's what we are going to assume. In fact, most of the papers on optimization uses this notation to actually mean this. Next comes convex functions. So I consider a function f from r into r. So you can give three definitions of convexity, uh, or rather four definitions. So let me write the zeroth definition. 
sublevel sets defined as x in R n such that f x is less than or equal to a is convex for all a in R. So this is known as sublevel sets, and so all sublevel sets should be convex. That's the zeroth definition. Definition number one: x y in R n alpha in zero one implies and this is for all alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y f of y okay I want to give you a picture to remember this is my coordinate axis this is x, this is f of x. My function looks something like this. So this is my x, this is my y. And I pick an intermediate point. So that's alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y. So this is alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y and I draw a line between fx and fy so this is my fx this is my fy and I draw a line like this and what this says is that the function evaluated at alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y which is this point must lie below the line Okay, so in general, what you mean is this, you, you consider the line between fx and fy, or you consider a hyperplane between fx and fy, and the entire function should actually be below that hyperplane. Okay, so you see this. This is the function between x and y, and this function actually lies below this hyperplane. Okay, so that's the meaning of or geometric interpretation of the first definition of convexity. The second definition is a second way to, uh, to uh, yeah, define or characterize a convex function is f of y should be greater than or equal to fx plus y minus x transpose gradient of fx. And the third is The second derivative of the function is positive semi-definite. So this is positive semi-definite. Okay. Yes. Does that third definition um, imply that convexity is, at least in in that two-dimensional space, the same thing as being concave up? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Any function. Well, if f is convex, then negative of f is concave, right? So if f is concave, then negative of f is convex and which just means it's a mirror image of the original function. Now let's see uh, so this is a pretty general statement and this requires one to define convexity or uh, one to understand convexity of certain sets. For this you need to know what the function is and then you can up check whether this inequality is satisfied for every x, y, and alpha in 0, 1 or not. Now in order to apply this result, you need to make sure that the function is differentiable at least once. Okay, if it is not, then you cannot check, you cannot use 2. 
Okay, you have to stick to either one or zero. For the third definition, you need the function to be second de twice differentiable. Okay, if it is not twice differentiable, then you cannot check for positive semi-definiteness, and you cannot conclude whether the function is convex or not. Right. So depending upon how pathological your function is, you can check whether the function is uh, convex or not based on one of these four equivalent definitions. Well, it's not equivalent. Uh, well, if function is twice differentiable, then all of these are equivalent. Okay, so next. Any question on this? Yeah. Oh, does the domain of a convex function need to be in Rn? No, it doesn't need to be Rn. You can replace it with the set over which the function is defined. Is there any other hands in the back? Any other question on this? OK. Uh, next topic is supporting hyperplane theorem. S supporting. Hyperplane theorem. Okay, so now the class is getting more complicated. I'm using theorems and lemmas and equivalent definitions and whatnot. Uh, that's the nature of this course. Uh, supporting hyperplane theorem. So C in Rn is convex. X bar not in the interior of the set C. Right, so interior of a set is everything except the boundary of the set. So I take a point x bar in the interior of the set C. Then there exists a vector A in Rn such that A transpose x is greater than or equal to A transpose x bar for all x in C. Okay, so what do I mean? I have a convex set that looks like this. I pick a point x bar. It's not in the interior. It's in actually on the boundary of the set. I could have taken the point outside the set itself, because all it requires is x, ha x bar should not be in the interior of the set C. So I took a point at the boundary. And I can find a vector a. So I'm going to draw a supporting hyperplane. So the reason why it's called supporting is because it's supporting the entire function on top of it. Uh, sorry, entire set on top of it. The normal to this hyperplane is the vector A. And it satisfies this, this condition. OK. Similarly, if I have a convex set, I pick an x bar which is outside of the set. I can find a hyperplane with actually let me let me make the slope a little different so as to differentiate between that. Okay, so I can take a hyperplane so that the function is separated from the point. Okay? So this hyperplane actually supports this particular convex set, and it separates the convex set with this point x bar that we started with. So that's supporting. Now I want to talk about separating hyperplane. Separating hyperplane. This is also a theorem. C1, C2 in Rn convex, C1 intersection C2 is a null set. <coughs> so uh, they are disjoint sets. Then there exists a, a in Rn such that A transpose x1 
is less than A transpose X2 for all X1 in C1 and X2 in C2. Okay, so the picture to have in mind is here is my C1, here is my C2, C1. Let me draw C2 a little bit different. Okay, this is my C2, this is convex, this is convex, they are disjoint. I can draw a line with normal A. So that it separates the two convex sets. Okay. So these things will uh, become important as we talk more and more about optimization over convex sets and we talk about some of the important uh, theorems in optimization. We will frequently use either supporting hyperplane theorem or separating hyperplane theorem to prove some results or understand some sort of concepts in abstract spaces. Okay, I'm saying abstract because I cannot draw it but you have to just somehow imagine what happens in Rn cross M, for instance, okay? Who can imagine what Rn, Rn cross Rm looks like? Very complicated space. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so that concludes the three lectures on introductory material for this class, and we'll jump right into optimization in the next class. So thank you guys. See you on uh, Wednesday.